Welcome to Residential Tech Talks. I'm Jeremy Glowacki, Executive Editor of Residential Tech Today. In this episode, I'm joined by Mike Phillips, CEO and co-founder of Sense Labs, a Cambridge, Massachusetts company whose Sense Home Energy Monitor provides real-time insights into home energy consumption. A pioneer in the field of machine learning, Mike began his career in speech recognition. He was a researcher at MIT before going on to co-found two speech recognition companies, SpeechWorks and Blingo, which brought speech recognition capabilities to call centers and to mobile phones, including the technology that would go on to power virtual assistants across hundreds of millions of phones, including iPhone, Android, and BlackBerry. Blingo's first speech recognition software with artificial intelligence capabilities later evolved into Apple's Siri and was available on Samsung Galaxy. Mike, thanks for joining us. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. Well, usually on this podcast, I have a pretty good idea where to start our conversation, but your, um, your resume is so intriguing, it's hard to know what to talk about first. Um, I, I thought maybe we could sort of go chronologically and you know, maybe not so far back into childhood and those <laughs> early men memories, but uh, you know, perhaps early education and life experience that put you on the path to um, your, you know, your college years. Uh, Carnegie Mellon and MIT are, are pretty renowned institutions. And I think um, a lot of listeners and viewers would like to know how you get on that path to those, to those institutions of higher learning. Um, so what, what would you say, um, you know, your, your early years were like, what your interests were to kind of get you on the path toward uh, creating technology innovation? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess I was the, the typical uh, uh, tech geek a, a, as a kid. So, uh, you know, back in the early days when computers were still uh, mainly things you'd go use in a big data center or someplace, but it's starting to be the personal computers were starting to happen. So I got very involved in that in the, even while I was in high school and also like electronic music and things like this. So that led me to be, uh, you know, go to college and uh, study electrical engineering as the, the base. Um, but then as part of that, I, I, I ended up uh, first doing some work on human hearing and then got into the speech recognition world. And this was, this was in the 1980s where, you know, we had this notion that we should be able to make computers that can understand speech, but mm -hmm. we were so far away from that being uh, reality. I mean, you know, the computers weren't fast enough. The data wasn't there. It, it would just uh, almost seemed impossible what we were trying to do. But you know, spent uh, many years first at Carnegie Mellon, then MIT, um, on big kind of DARPA-funded projects, uh, and you know, lots and lots of people. There were literally thousands of people working on this stuff uh, back in the 1980s to try to figure out how to make computers able to do pattern recognition to understand speech, to understand speech. So, so how do you? I, I know that engineers end up in a specialty for, um, you know, whether it's mechanical or electrical and um, how does one end up in speech recognition? What, what was the thing that kind of clicked for that to happen? Well, I think it's partly just an in, environment and so in, in where you are. So I, when I was at Carnegie Mellon, there was a, quite a, a, a big effort there as part of the Robotics uh, Institute. Um, and then I, I got connected to the folks at MIT and moved over there to do do similar things. So the, these were institutions that were kind of leading the way along with Bell Labs and IBM and others in the speech recognition world. So, you know, being part of a, a place that has this kind of concentration is, is you know, partly what leads you down a, a particular path, at least as a youngster who doesn't have a, yet a, a clear notion of what they want to do. So. And so what were some of those early challenges with speech recognition? Um, what were some of the, what the evolution of progress that was made there uh, in that research you did in those early days? Well, the, the list of challenges is, is really large. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, back then, computers were not good enough to do this kind of thing. I mean, we, you know, we, what we've learned in, in the last, you know, 30 or 40 years on this is to make these kind of machine learning kind of problems work well from a computer standpoint is just lots and lots of data really really complex models and you know it seems a little non-intuitive because we you know computers are really good at some things um uh you know uh adding up tons of numbers they can do way way better than humans can do but for these 
kind of pattern recognition tasks. So they're, you know, speech recognition, vision, uh, driving a car, walking up and down stairs. These are, they seem easy to us because we're so good at them as humans, but they're incredibly hard to figure out how to make a computer do these things. Um, and at the same time, we know that they're possible, right? You know, it just seems like a really, really hard uh, data challenge and machine learning challenge, but we know it's possible because humans can do them. Um, we'll get back to that in the, the stuff we're doing here at Sense, mm -hmm. where it's not clear that it's possible, but things like speech recognition, vision, self-driving cars, we know are all possible because humans can do them. Right. And just the leap to go from how do you make a computer do that is, is uh is is really tough. There's a whole field that you probably hear about all the time called uh, machine learning, sure. deep learning, and so on. And these are all kind of interrelated in this pattern recognition intelligence of how do you use lots of data, lots of learning, lots of experience to let computers do these tasks that just seem um, seem easy to us and really hard if you want to write a program to do it. So, so you received your undergraduate degree at Carnegie Mellon and then went on to MIT for a postgraduate? Yeah, I actually uh, undergrad at MIT, uh, sorry, CMU, oh. and then I went uh, I went Carnegie Mellon. So then um, uh, I went to MIT, not as a grad student, but as a research scientist. So oh, okay. I was actually kind of skipped over the grad school business and went right into a research group there. Okay. Uh, and got to do, you know, really cutting edge stuff there. But mm -hmm. then, I, you know, I got to the point where that was a great environment and great, great fun, but I wanted to do something stuff more real. So that's when I uh, decided it was time to, to uh, get into the commercial world. world. I realized I could either start uh, join a big company or start a company. And I decided, well, startup seems like a fun thing to do. So I, I did that without a lot of knowledge about how to do it. But there's a ton of uh, you know people around places like MIT and Stanford that do know these things and quickly got into the startup world. Um, this first company, Speechworks, progressed from you know, four people that we didn't quite know what we're doing to one of the market leaders for these call center based speech recognition. Um, and it was a, you know, a smooth progression between that four person startup and, and a, uh, uh, you know, a market leading company in this. We, we had an IPO back in year 2000 at the very tail end of the dot com era. So kind of a, a crazy time in the startup world. Then we survived the tech downturn after that and got bought in 2003 as a public company. Uh, I stayed there for a couple of years. I was the CTO of a company that we ended up being a couple thousand people when I left. Mm. Uh, but I left because I wanted to go do something more consumer centric. And we saw mobile phones were getting kind of interesting. You know, at the time they were just flip phones and Blackberries, but we saw them getting connected to data networks and we knew that they would transform. It was kind of obvious to everybody. And we thought you should be able to talk to them instead of uh, typing at them. And we can use the fact that they're connected to data networks to do heavy duty server side processing. It's now known as cloud processing, right? Mm -hmm. right? But it was before that was a name for that. Uh, but we could use server side processing along with a little software on the phone to do this much more, um, you know, personal assistant, virtual assistant, kind of say whatever you want on your phone and have it do the right thing for you. And that was, um, was that Blingo then that uh, was that? Yep. Okay. And come, come. Go ahead. sorry. And, and, and that, that led to, um, a, a, the backbone technology for a lot of consumer products then after um, you developed it that over years of time, I'm sure. Many years. Yeah. And like I said, there was lots of people working on these sort sure. of things. Lingo was kind of one of the, the first to do with this virtual assistant on mobile phones. Uh, you mentioned Siri. We actually worked with Siri in their early days that they were just getting off the ground. They were also a little startup like us. They got bought by Apple and went off and did their own thing then. But then we were the voice interface for Samsung, Nokia, uh, Blackberry, so like Samsung S Voice was based on on our products. So, um, so you give them a starting point um, license technology to them, and then they were they were able to take it and develop proprietary aspects to it. Or... Yeah, and we did a lot of joint work with them to get that out there. But but you know, it allowed us to progress from a couple of billion consumers to hundreds of millions mm -hmm. of end users throughout the world using this kind of technology. So, were you um, when you started? Blingo and began working on more consumer facing technology. Were you um, in this for many, many years before we experienced it as a in product in these other um, technologies? 
Yeah, I mean, certainly as a as a startup, it, it's really important the timing, right? You, oh yeah. You, you got to kind of uh, be out there, kind of in the early days before a market really develops. Um, but if you if you start too soon, you, you you miss the window, and if you start too late, it's already a a, a, a well known thing. So when we started Lingo, this notion of built to say whatever you want in your phone and have it do do the right thing which is a crazy idea that people didn't think was possible or why you, would you even want that? You, you know, now it seems like totally obvious that, that you, you would use your phone for, you know, doing all sorts of different things and speaking to it as at least one of the interfaces you use. That, that just wasn't as obvious then. And a lot of people questioned whether we could or should do that. Um, but that then led to some success from consumers and mass adoption. And then when Google and Apple really bought into that with Android and, and Siri on, on iPhones, the, the entire market just, just took off. And then, of course, um, what happened with Amazon Alexa was kind of a surprise to all of us that there would be an in-home little piece of hardware that you would talk to. Um, we knew it would be possible. It just didn't, we weren't sure if people wanted that. But... Uh, Amazon did this amazing thing with Alexa, and it, it, it really then spurred a whole whole new uh, ecosystem around this stuff. Yeah, I think it's easy to forget how we have just sort of taken it for granted that it wasn't there for the longest time, and all of a sudden yeah. it's it's a real thing. And yeah. and I think uh, um, you know you you, uh, you you sort of wonder like what the differences are too if you're a consumer. Um, I, I'm curious how you might describe what. Uh, what Amazon was able to do um, versus how your early technologies might have functioned. Do you have any way of comparing and contrasting or is it just different um, machine learning uh, processes or? Well, I mean, behind the scenes, like I say, there, there really are thousands of people working on kind of the underlying technology for how these things get better and better. And there's been, you know, kind of, incremental progress uh, along with with big revolutions and kind of the underlying technology uh, these things called deep learning uh, is, is now kind of uh, what's taking over everything where you have lots and lots and lots of data and you can use that huge amounts of data to have machines that learn the kind of the all, all the details that they matter so that's the behind the scenes work and look everyone is is paying attention to what's happening there and learning from each other uh, publishing research papers about it and so on. So I think there's a lot of commonality throughout that research community. The, the thing that Alexa, Amazon did differently than others was this notion of having a, a piece of hardware in your house that you could just speak to from across the room. Um, the across the room part does make it quite a bit harder, but uh, they were able to overcome that. And um, and consumers were, were willing or, or excited to have this thing in their house. Uh, that they can just talk to and play their music for them and order stuff and so on. So, well, I I, I want to bring us to present day and talk yeah. about your new company, but I, I need to take a quick break uh, for a word from our sponsor. This episode of Residential Tech Talks is brought to you by Ring, home security systems and smart home automation. Get protection at every corner with their intelligent security cameras, alarm systems, and video doorbells. Receive notifications when motion is detected or check on your home anytime with Live View in the Ring app. Help keep your neighborhood safer with the Neighbors app to share information and discuss safety concerns in this hyper-local social networking platform. Ring's mission is simple. Make neighborhoods safer. Discover all the smart home security products by Ring. Go to ring.com. Welcome back. I'm talking to Sense CEO Mike Phillips. I'm Residential Tech Today Executive Editor Jeremy Gowacki. Mike, um, now that we're acquainted with your earlier career, um, how did your passion for machine learning lead to founding your current company, Sense Labs? Uh, was it 2013 that you founded the company? And, and uh, how did you change to a focus on energy monitoring in the home? Yeah, so, so that's right. So my previous company, Lingo, we were bought in 2012. Um, and then I, I was clear that I was not sticking around there. Um, and wanted to do a new startup, wanted it to, to not be speech recognition, <laughs> and uh, just because uh, I've been doing that for long enough, um, and, and also wanted to do something uh, uh, more meaningful than having people you know talk to their phone and, and so on. And uh, myself and the two other co-founders of, of Sense, so uh, Chris, Chris McCauley and Ryan Hewlett, the three of us were all together at Lingo, started Sense together. And you know we came at this from a you know, how can we use the stuff that we know in, in a in a space that, that has more 
kind of uh, uh, meaning for the world and do useful things. We got we're very um, uh, worried about the whole climate change uh, topic and want to figure out how can we do our part to help with um, you know energy efficiency, carbon reduction, and so on. And, and look, we didn't start out to build a uh, electrical load disaggregation company. We started with this high level view about how do we take the stuff we know, which is consumer facing uh, kind of intelligence related applications and apply it to homes and help homes be more efficient, more reliable, safer, and so, and so on. Um, and so the notion was that if we could know in detail what's happening in homes, like if the, if the system could know in detail what's happening in a home and we could engage the consumers around that with, with applications, we should be able to help those consumers make their homes more efficient, better users of energy, and what we've since found, of course, is we, we got to go broader than just that and reliability, safety, security, awareness, and so on in the homes. Um, so that, that's what led us down that path without a, uh, a super specific view. But over mm -hmm. time, we've been able to evolve that uh, quite dramatically. So. so how does the product actually work? You're installing um, a piece of it in the panel, the electrical panel, correct? And then it, the, the uh, interface is an, an app? Yeah, so, you know, as I said, our, our, our notion is that if we can know in detail what's happening in the home and engage the consumer with an application around that, we should be able to help them. So, you know, the, the first part is, is how do you know in detail what's happening in the home? And look, if it were the case that the Internet of Things or smart home tech was pervasive, and if all devices would just, you know, tell us what they're doing, we're happy to make use of, of that mm -hmm. in a central kind of way. But as you know, you know, unless you have a, a fully automated home that's we're pretty far away from that being um, uh, ubiquitous so, so we decided we didn't want to wait for all devices in a home to become smart and have a api connection that's a programming connection to it so, so we want to find a different way to know in detail what's happening in the home we realize that the stuff we care about is mostly connected to the power of your home mm -hmm. and different devices use power in a slightly different way so the notion was that if we could measure the power coming into your house in a detailed enough way, could we actually tell what's going on just by the, the power signals that we can measure? This is not a new idea. It's called load disaggregation. Some guys at MIT were working on it back in the 1990s. Um, but <laughs> the reason this relates back to the previous story is uh, it turns out to be really hard. <laughs> it turns out to be just as hard as speech recognition, if not a bit harder. Because it, and it's similar, right? There's the power we, you can think of as a signal, just like an audio signal, right? Mm -hmm. And the different devices use some power in different ways. They kind of they're like noise or different kind of sounds, like they're making the power. But they they um, but but there's a whole bunch of them running at the same time. So it's like do it's like doing speech, speech recognition with thirty people talking at once. Mm -hmm. So it turns out to just be a a very very tough uh, machine learning problem. Uh, different, it's easier in some ways, but harder in other ways in speech recognition. So we had to just spend the first couple of years just working away on the technology. The one thing we realized is to, to do this well enough, we needed really good signals. Um, look, we're mainly software and data and consumer application people, uh, but we realized there was no source of the data that we wanted. So we had to go down the path of building a hardware product. So our product is a little, little box. It goes inside your electrical panel. Um, uh, it's easy to install. There's these two uh, clamps just clamp around the main power coming into your house, CT clamps. And then we plug into a breaker to power the box and to measure voltage. The CT clamps measure current, the, the breaker tells us the voltage. Um, and, and this is normal power meter stuff. So this is what any other power meter does. Okay. However, we're measuring power at a million times a second. Mm. So crazy high resolution power. Uh, you know, we just couldn't get the signals we wanted out of the, the existing utility meter, for example, that that measures power every 15 minutes or measures more more internally, but sends power up every 15 minutes, just not good enough. Right. So, so we went down this path. We have to get super high resolution data, have to do it with our own hardware. So that's what the product does. It's a, like I said, gets installed in the electrical panel, easy to install. However, since installed inside the electrical panel, you got to get an electrician to do it for sure. you. But once it's there, now it's got this high resolution data, it's got Wi-Fi out to the network, mm -hmm. and then we're doing machine learning on the signals to figure out, oh, this is what your toaster looks like, this is what your microwave looks mm -hmm. like, and then be able to recognize them. Not perfectly, because like I say, it's a super hard problem, but we're increasingly able to figure out what's going on in the home in real time based on that. And then it's exposed to the 
user through a, a real-time application where you can open up this app and you can see see what's going on in your home. That seems amazing to me that you could um, predict a home's behavior. Um, homes are different. I mean, there are similarities obviously between them, but sizes and rooms and types of um, of appliances, and you're able to get a sort of a signature for, just say like the toaster you mentioned, um, yeah. as a similar uh, measurement to another toaster in somebody else's home, right? And so you're able to kind of quickly identify these things in various homes, or is there a customization as it's installed in each home that makes it work? Yeah, it's a combination. So it does have to learn about your home. So when you first install it, it doesn't know about these different things. It's just a real-time power meter when you first install it. Okay. But over time, it learns, uh, it, it detects something that it thinks is a, it sees a cycling inductive motor and decides it's probably your refrigerator and says, hey, I found your refrigerator. And then a few days later, it'll find your garage door opener and, and so on. Um, and about, it's finding about 30 devices per home on average. So okay. we, we can't do this perfectly. We find on average about 30 devices per home. And about 70% of them, we're pretty sure we know what it is. So we say, we found your toaster, we found your microwave. The other 30% come up as, we found a motor, we don't know what it is. Um, so we call it motor two. And then it's up to you to know, oh, the motor two bubble pops up when my blender turns on. So it's my blender. Mm. You type in blender and now it shows up as blender in your app. And of course, the, the good thing for us is once we have thousands of people typing in Blender, and if Blenders are different enough from other things, we'll in the future be able to say, oh, I see that you have a Blender. Uh -huh. So this is reporting back to um, a, a database for you guys to be able to kind of gather that machine learning or? Yeah, so, so you know, the runtime processing, so the thing that all day long is saying, did the toaster just turn on? That happens in the orange box, but learning what your toaster looks like happens in the cloud. In the cloud, right? Um, and the application server. And okay. you know, we're very careful about the data. The our agreement with the consumers is it's actually your data, but you give us rights to use it for system development. Okay, gotcha. And then you've had it to to be able to work with these other um, smart uh, um, technologies as well. So you can utilize some of that, even though you don't expect it all to be in the home. If it's there, you can pull from that data as well um, for your system. That's right. We've done software integrations with like TP-Link plugs and Wemo plugs that are energy reporting plugs and also Philips Hue lighting. Um, we've done some, some work with uh, Ecobee thermostats, for example. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, over time, we're going to be connecting in with more and more devices um, that are out there in, in homes. And we think that that's you know, we're not just trying to be an electrical load disaggregation company, as I mentioned. We want to be kind of this intelligence, making use of data wherever we can get it. Um, I mean, the, the other thing to mention is, you know, doing this as our this retrofit orange box that goes inside your electrical panel is fine to start. But look, we think that this should become, you know, part of the default of what's in homes and buildings over time, and it's just got to get built in for that to happen. Um, so we have a really great partnership with um, with uh, Schneider, who is you know on Square D. Mm -hmm. So that they're building this kind of technology into their future products that they've announced recently. They do already have a version of our product on the market. It's called Wiser. Uh, so it's uh, it's it's their version of our hardware, but running our application on it. Mm -hmm. So we're working quite closely with the, with those guys and very excited about it as this progresses. That this starts to just be built into. Imagine you had a a, a panel that just comes with your home that already has this kind of functionality built in. Uh, so, so besides monitoring energy, what would your ultimate goal be to able, be able to to see as a consumer if you were away from your home? Like, what what are you getting uh, information about besides just you know what what's drain, pulling what you know power from what you know, device? Yeah, so, so um, we, we do think that the, and we are providing kind of value beyond just energy, which is uh, one thing that we, we're seeing is driving engagement. So like people are, like half of our users open the app on any given week and they open the average app like 10 times a week on average. So to drive that kind of engagement is not energy. Mm -hmm. um, people are using it because they can see, you know, they leave the house and they, they can use the app to check to see if they left the oven on when they left or is the garage door open or you know, when did the TV turn off last night, or is the dryer done, and stuff like that. They okay. can set alerts and things like that. Sure. Okay. So that, that kind of home activity is what drives engagement. Mm -hmm. We're also just starting to release some functionality for um, 
fault detection. So like, you know, today the way you know your air conditioner is not working right is your house doesn't get cool anymore. But at that point, it's an emergency. We can see ahead of time to some degree when things are failing before they fail. So in particular, we're seeing, you know, start capacitor failures right now in, in HVAC systems and starting to alert consumers about that so they could fix it ahead of time. Uh, and then over time, you know, we're not just trying to be monitoring. We're trying to be this next kind of intelligence for the home, mm -hmm. uh, working with those, these other products for doing things like automation. Um, so, you know, even in the energy side, um, you know, to be a, a good user of energy in a home, it's not just being efficient. There's starting to be a lot of a need for shifting energy to good times to use your energy, mm -hmm. right? So things like, um, you know, if you get an electric vehicle, and you get home and you plug it in and start charging right at 6 p.m., that may actually be a bad thing for your, your utility who's trying to reduce their carbon footprint by more renewables and so on. Right. So by working with utilities and working with consumers, we think we can add this kind of automation where you don't care when your car gets charged. You plug it in and let us decide when to charge as long as it goes far enough tomorrow, and then we can find a good time to charge the car. Right. So that's the kind of thing that we're heading towards uh, so think of this monitoring as the base to drive the intelligence, but the intelligence to be then used to drive automation and things like that. Uh, you mentioned renewables. So is this, um, it, it, does it work with solar, solar and uh, renewable type uh, energy as well in some regard? Yeah, so um, we've been supporting uh, solar in a really nice way. So if you have solar panels uh, on, on your roof, we get another set of CT clamps so we can measure the solar directly. So you can see in the same app, you can see your solar production, you can see your consumption. Um, and, and a really useful thing for people, especially if they're in states that no longer have net metering, where you're getting paid less for the solar you export than the power you import, right? It's actually then helpful to try to shift your usage a bit more under the solar. Um, and you know, just having that visibility is something people haven't had and we're giving them that visibility for doing that. In a manual way now, and that, that will be part of the automation that we do over time is to shift more of your load underneath solar. Okay, makes sense. So, I mean, no conversation uh, is complete these days without talking pandemic. Uh, how, how has COVID-19 changed uh, the way your company is functioning these days? Yeah, I mean, well, internally, of course, it means that we're all working from home, but fortunately, we are able to work from home. Know, compared to a lot of people out there that have a real problem with this. So, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's harder to be working from home, but we're able to do it. And then as far as the consumer base and products, we are, you know, people are spending more time at home. They're, they are more concerned about the energy that they use and the health and safety of their home. So we, we are seeing kind of good dynamics in the market for us still. So I, I don't think that that has caused us to, to back off from the things that we're doing. It did cause us to, um, this, uh, this uh, air conditioner fault detection that I mentioned, we decided to push that out more quickly than we otherwise would have, mm. thinking it might be helpful for people, right? You know, you have, having your air conditioner break down in the middle of the summer when you're all stuck at home is a really bad thing. Sure. And you don't necessarily want to have someone come in your house to take a look at it when there's no problem. So giving people advance warning that their air conditioner is not working right is something we decided to, to push out a little bit more quickly due to the pandemic. When you look out beyond what you're currently working on as a company, what other technologies um, excite you or are you keeping an eye on uh, for the future? Well, I mean, we're, we're certainly uh, deep into this world of the uh, transition to a cleaner energy world. Uh, we think that's just going to, it's got to happen. It's, it's going to be accelerating. Um, so, you know, we, we are doing our part as this making homes intelligent, but we're quite uh, uh, plugged into the overall space around what's happening with renewables, what's happening with um, electrification of, of systems and homes, um, uh, what's happening with storage, uh, you know, and, and we are seeing like, even like utilities are now uh, making really big commitments to, to the change that's going to be happening. So, so we, we do see this big groundswell towards, um, uh, uh, both business models and technologies that are changing that are going to help with the climate problem. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate your time today. It's been great getting to know more about Sense Labs and uh, your, your work in, in that uh, category. And we look forward to keeping an eye on, on things as they evolve. Thank you very much. It's great to, great to join you.
Also, thanks to everybody for joining us. Be sure to comment, share, or subscribe to the podcast. You can check out all the latest residential tech news at restechtoday.com. And until next time, please stay safe, stay inspired, and let us know if you have a great story to tell.